Hey there everyone, today I'm going to be walking you through how to use my real estate acquisition model specifically for apartments or other residential for lease product. Uh, for this tutorial, I thought to uh, change things up, I'm going to use an actual property and I'm going to run it through the model. Uh, I went to LoopNet, I found a property, I don't know anything about this, I don't know this submarket that well, so my assumptions will be pretty pretty soft. Uh, nonetheless, it'll it'll serve its purpose for this exercise. I also chose a property that the price is not disclosed. That'll give us a chance to not be influenced by, by a broker's price and just set our own. Now this doesn't come with a full operating memorandum, but there's a flyer and the flyer has enough information for us to finish this tutorial. Now here we see it's Serrano Village located in this zip code of Phoenix, Arizona. 124 apartment units. Uh, built early 70s, so this is class C product, uh, maybe call it class B, and we'll assume just for this exercise that these units are, are in market condition, uh, so they'll need limited deferred maintenance investment when we acquire this. So the thought is, sure, these, this is older product, so it's going to require more CapEx every year, but we don't have to come up with a lot of cash up front. We're assuming that this is in, in decent condition given its age. We see it's 4.47 uh, acres. It's contiguous to the Grand Canyon University. Now, we're not going to model this specifically as student housing, which would be modeled on a per bed basis. Uh, this We're still considering this a standard multifamily, but it is nice that there's this demand driver here in the university as well as a demand driver here and I guess uh, the, the hospitality management school. So kind of sandwiched in between those, it's a nice uh, demand driver. Also apparently there's some nice mass transit uh, that might help out. I, I guess these two things might might keep our, our vacancy lower than it otherwise would be. Uh, but again, this isn't an, an underwriting exercise. This is an understanding how to use this model exercise. So we'll ignore a lot of this and just kind of focus on the mechanics of putting this into the model. So with that, here we have the broker's information. We're going to assume that this is accurate. We're going to assume that these rents right here are in-place rents and that they are market rents. We're also going to assume that these operating expenses are actual. And then finally, the broker has a lost old lease line item. We're going to ignore that just for this exercise, uh, but we're going to raise our vacancy just ever so slightly. I think we'll probably model in an 8% vacancy, and that should account for some of this lost old lease. How, how I assume this, uh, is, I, what I assume this is here is, is that there are some leases in place that are below market. But again, for this exercise, we're going to ignore that. We're also going to be modeling in some other income. This to me seems a little aggressive, and so we'll probably be modeling in a value less than this. But everything else, we'll pretty much model uh, as the broker has given it to us. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to take this. I'm going to shrink it a little smaller to that side of the screen, pull this over, and let's go get go ahead and get started. I'm going to start with my property summary tab. We have a property name which was Serrano Village. It's in Phoenix, Arizona. We're going to assume the, the occupancy right now is 93 percent. Our purchase price method, now again we have four options, manual input where we just drop a value in, we have a DCF value where we're going to back into it based on a discount rate, we've got cap year one NOI at some market cap rate or we have replacement cost. In this case I'm going to use DCF value, I want to back into this based on some return uh, that, that we're targeting. Analysis start, I'm going to put January of 2016. Now, analysis period, so how, how long are we going to hold this thing? I'm going to say 10 years. And then I'm going to cap year 11 NOI for my uh, terminal value. The next question is, how much do we want our cap rate to grow or shrink from when we go in versus when we go out? For now, I'm going to leave this as zero. But what we'll do is we'll come back to this at the end. And we'll gauge what our going in cap rate is going to be. And we'll... we'll We'll forecast as best we can what we think the terminal cap rate will be 10 years from now. Next we have a discount rate. How I think of discount rate is this is the unlevered return that I'd like to get on my capital. 
uh, or or that I could get on my capital and, and other investments of this similar risk profile. And so given the, the vintage of this property and the market, I'm going to call this, I don't know, 7.5%. We, we may come back and adjust that depending on where it looks like our value is at. That works for here. Then we have re replacement cost per unit. Now this is an important in this case because we are not using replacement cost, a uh, purchase price method. Uh, but just just for kicks, we'll call it sixty thousand. We'd know we or we would have a better idea of this if we were actually in the market and we understood this, uh, you know, this submarket and the product. We'd we'd uh, consult with an architect uh, to get a value here. But for, just for this exercise, exercise we'll put sixty thousand. Number of units. 124 upfront capex so uh, at time zero at, at the moment that we purchase this how much money we're going are we going to have to spend uh, to get the property to market condition just for here I'm gonna call it zero again we're assuming that this property is already in market condition the next question is acquisition cost what's it going to cost to acquire this uh, for this exercise I'm going to call it 1% now this is not including lender fees. So this is our due diligence, our environmental studies, uh, our property condition studies. Perhaps we have uh, an acquisitions team on staff that we pay commissions or we pay bonuses to for, for acquiring property. So that's what this 1% is here. Then we have other income. Now the broker assumes 45000 I think that's pretty aggressive. Um, we're going to call it 25,000, and then this 25,000, you'll notice, will grow at some inflated rate. Um, then, in terms of general vacancy, the broker has 7% plus that loss to old lease. I'd mention we're going to do 8% here. Next, how much capital or equity do we have to come in as the sponsor, and how much equity are, are we going to go out and raise from limited partners? And so in this case, I'm going to assume we're going to come up with 10%. We'll come back at the end once we have a value, and we'll look at that and, and determine whether, whether we can manage whatever that equity slug is going to be. Then we have a promote structure, and again, this, this will depend on what our returns are looking like and what we reasonably think uh, we can structure with our investor partners. Finally, inflation. I'm going to assume, uh, based on the area and some of the demand drivers we're having, I don't know the submarket, and it, if I were typically uh, uh, modeling this, uh, I'd take some time to look at uh, market studies and the like. But in this case, I'm just going to assume on a 1.5% growth on my rent, I'm go only going to grow other income by 1%, and then I'm going to grow my expenses by 2% each. Now this releasing cost expense, this is different from capital expenditures. What I, what I think of releasing is uh, apartment turns over and we have to go in and from time to time we're going to have to paint, we might have to replace carpet. Uh, it's, not, it's not your typical capex, which this is what I think of roof, structure, sidewalks, exterior, etc. This right here is, it, this is the cosmetics on the interior of an apartment that gets uh, just worn out as, as tenants come and go. And we're growing that at 2%. Then in terms of our debt, I'm going to assume a loan that's 70% loan to value, 30 year amortization, uh, we're 10 year term, and an interest rate of four and a quarter, and then 1% in lender fee. So here we have our property summary inputs. Let's go to the rent roll. And again, you fill blue fonted cells. We'll go ahead and delete the old property that we had and let's just drop these in. We see the rent roll right here. I'm going to I'm going to pause the video, fill this out. Actually, let me fill the first one first. So uh, we have a studio. There are 40 studio units as we can see right here. These are zero bedrooms, one bathroom, uh, 430 square feet. They rent for, if you notice over here, $510 a month. I'm going to assume some lease term right on each one of these. And just for simplicity, I'm going to call it 12 months of uh, lease term. And then I have a CapEx per unit. Uh, on product of this age, we might expect you know, maybe $600 a year per unit. And so let's call this $50 a month. And then free rent per lease. Are we offering some rent concessions? Uh, we're going to assume no. 
especially at an 8% vacancy, I think that's reasonable. Uh, but again, it's, that's market specific. And then days vacant between leases. So uh, when a lease expires and that tenant vacates, how long until we get a new tenant in? How much loss do we have between those tenants? Um, and part of that's also releasing, right? So you might have to go in, spend a week, uh, put some lipstick on, on the uh, unit. And so for this case, I'm going to call it 20 days. And then releasing cost per unit. Uh, when, a when a tenant does vacate, what's it going to cost to get that uh, unit back to condition? And, and given the age of these units, uh, the profile of our tenants and the like, I'm going to call it 300 bucks a unit. But I'm going to assume that only about, um, let's see, this is a renewal probability. I'm going to assume that 60% of our tenants renew. Now I'm going to pause the video. I'm going to fill out the rest of these so we can get our rent roll done. You don't have to sit and, and watch. So there we have the rent roll filled out. Let me stretch this a little bit more so you can see. We, all, we see the property return metrics, and these start filling up. Now, um, this obviously is not going to be accurate until we finish with all of our inputs, but you can, you can see on each tab here, we have this property returns. It's that floating summary box and kind of gives you a feel for how the returns are uh, coming together. So let's finish by operating expenses. Uh, so I have some basic categories here. And the categories won't always match up, but we'll do our best. So we've got payroll of 115,000. Uh, let me zero these out so I don't forget anything first. Oops. Okay. So I'm just going to start over here. Payroll 115, 115. Uh, utilities of 200,000. Property insurance of 186. Property taxes of thirty nine five fifty. Repairs and maintenance R and M of eighty six eight. Management fee three percent. Uh, administrative and advertising of thirty five thousand. Now the broker also included a replacement reserve. We have that built in on our rent roll as our capex, and our number is going to be quite a bit higher than the than the broker, and that's not a surprise, but I don't think anyone reasonably expects that for $300 a year you can keep these units, these early 70s units in market condition. Um, and so that's why we're quite a bit higher there. So now we have our OPEX number in, and these, our uh, returns here should be pretty close. So at this at this uh, discount rate, 7.5%, that would give a purchase price of $7 million. Uh, if we if we came up with 10% of the equity based on a loan of just shy of $5 million, our share would be 223000 And then uh, our the property level, come down here, levered IRRs 12%. So let's say we had these hurdles. We offer our uh, limited partners an 8% preferred return. Uh, and, and so what that means is up to 8%, we split... Uh, the returns 90% to the limited partners, 10% to us, or pro rata based on our equity contribution. And then above 8%, there's some outsized return, uh, a promote, that's offered to us, the sponsor, for putting the deal together, for, for uh, helping to manage the property and the, and the like. So uh, we're going to say from 8 to 12%. That's there's there's a 10% promote to offered to us, which based on this equity gives 19% to the sponsor, 81% to the LP, up to a 12% return. And then from a 12 up to a 15, there's going to be a 25% promote, which gives 32.50 to the sponsor, 67.50 to the limited partner, up to 15%. And then above 15% is 35%, 35 35.65, which has this breakdown based on uh, this equity. Uh, uh, in. So uh, based on all of the assumptions that we just put in, and that was pretty simple. I think that took us a total of about 15 minutes to do this. Uh, we have down here our investor level returns. This is on a, a levered basis. The sponsor, us, we would get about 15% return. Uh, that's 223 equity in. We get 786 out. That's a total profit of 563, which over a 10 year period, uh, is again that that uh, IRR and this is our equity multiple so we increase our equity by about three and a half times which is a healthy return 
at least based on this purchase price here. Uh, then we have the limited partner. They get a 12% return, which I think uh, for a lot of limited partner partners they'd be happy with. Uh, their uh, con equity contribution, $2 million. Uh, they get back 5.3, which is a 3.3 million uh, profit or a 2.67 equity multiple. Now this is our quick back of the envelope, and, and if, if this was something that we were interested in, we might then uh, reach out to the broker, try to get a feel for uh, where the seller thinks pricing should come in at, and we might start having to uh, sharpen our, our pencil, pencil some. But uh, this is, gives you a, f a feel for how uh, to use my uh, real estate uh, apartment acquisition model. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out, and thank you for your time.